Nicole Lazaro is a world-renowned game researcher, designer, and speaker. She's discovered the four keys to fun in 2004, a model used by hundreds of thousands of game developers. She designed the iPhone's first accelerometer game, Tilt World, which aims to plant one million trees in Madagascar. She's been named one of the most influential women in gaming by Fast Company, Forbes, and Gamasutra. Her work on user experience and emotion spans over two decades. And she's worked with EA, Ubisoft, DICE, and the White House to help unlock human potential to improve our world. Here today to talk about the four most important emotions for free-to-play games is the one and only Nicole Lazaro. Give it up. Yeah, I think so. All right, can you, uh, we get an audio? Awesome. Well, I'm really appreciative of everybody showing up today and uh, last session of the day. Uh, it'll be fun to uh, get, this, uh, get this party started. So um, for those of you I haven't met, I'm Nicole Lazaro. And uh, I have a degree in, in cognitive psychology, just to get a little sense of where I come from, uh, from Stanford University. And uh, I use this uh, in my consulting that I've r used to run uh, Zero Design for the past uh, 20 years. Uh, we've got Zero Design is my main company. We also have an experimental lab called Zeoplay, which is where we're running our experimental games, such as Tilt World, to identify new engagement mechanics uh, for our clients. Here's a selection of them. We've worked, I uh, had the privilege of working on uh, leading franchises such as The Sims and, and Myst and uh, the Diner Dash franchise as well. And uh, when, we, when we talk about where I'm coming from, it's essentially I do player experience consulting. That's what my firm does. So we do a variety of design reviews, player testing, game designs, and play shops. I just came back from Singapore where I gave a play shop on game design for uh, their government. So how can they gamify procurement and that, that sort of thing, teaching procurement and that sort of thing. So uh, that's, that's a little bit, about, uh, little bit about me. So let's get into the subject. So we've got the good news about free-to-play, as everyone in the room knows, is that the, you know, is if you offer something for free, a lot more people download it. And in fact, a heck of a lot more people download it. It might be you know, a, thousand, a thousand to one. The trouble, of course, is, the problem, is that fewer than 1% often will actually pay for the experience. And so one of the challenges this, in this moment in time, one of the primary challenges of us uh, as in the games business is trying to figure out how do we get these players to convert from free to, to play. In our research, what we've done is we've looked at people playing games uh, in a number of games such as you know, Candy Crush, uh, Jetpack Joyroid, Tiny Towers, Farmville, lots of free-to-play games. And what's working is what we call engagement loops. These engagement loops drive purchases. So these purchases are designed inside of engagement loops. And these are the same action emotion pairs that we see drive play. So in our model, the four keys to fun, uh, it's, the same, it's the same kind of uh, principles at work. So that's what we're going to go, go into today in our very short, short time together. So emotions increase engagement. And the idea is that you have multiple loops. And uh, you know, you're basically connecting the player's heart and the, their emotions and their brain. And their brain is, of course, attached to the finger, which is allowing those, those, player, those player actions. And if you have multiple loops, increases the number of engagement, potential engagement points. And if you keep players engaged in activities related to purchases, chances are you're going to experience more purchases. And that's indeed what we are, we are seeing. So I'd like to pull out four of these loops. There are many of them. But I'm going to pull out four of them today to talk about these four emotions and how they increase engagement. Now, to talk about what an engagement loop is, I'm going to give you the 20-second uh, the version of what an engagement loop is. And it's called, as part of our model, the four keys to fun. And essentially, what it does is uh, these four keys create engagement with play. These are things that we actually observed players doing. So to start, let me explain what we learned. Uh, we already know from neuroscience of the past you know, 10 to 20 years is that emotions do these really five cool, cool things. Emotions will actually help us focus. They help us remember something when we would otherwise forget if we have a strong emotion. They help us make a decision. So two options, one with more emotions, you know, it's much easier to decide. Uh, it actually also prevents, uh, affects performance. So the type of emotion encourages certain types of activities more than others. Uh, you can ask me a little bit more about that after the session today. Um, we won't have time to go much into number four, but that's fascinating. And then five, they're also learn it's also involved in learning. So the buzz we get from learning, the, the reward we get from learning, is, uh, happens on an emotional layer, too. So what we did is we looked at people playing, um, playing games, popular games, homeschool and work, and we found that there were different types of emotions in different portions of play. We took their favorite moments in games and then did something kind of cool with it. We organized those favorite moments by the emotions players were feeling. And so we discovered that there really wasn't just one type of fun and that there were multiple types of, there were multiple kinds of fun. 
And so here we have emotions like fiero and frustration, wonder and surprise, curiosity. These were all attached to different types of behavior in the games. So working backwards from the emotion back to the behavior we could observe, the player actions, we noticed that there were really these four play styles that were responsible for what players most liked in, about games. And uh, this created a map of engagement for designing engagement. And that's where we're going to jump off to uh, today. So that was the whirlwind tour of uh, how, games, um, how games create engagement. So we created a map of these player actions. We studied the interplay of how these emotions work together. And most interesting, it's the interplay between emotions that results in a lot of the fun. So for example, you can't feel victory unless you felt really frustrated first. You know, you can't push a button and win, right? And so it's these sequences of emotions that drive game mechanics. It also drives purchases, which was really, really fun for us to discover. So the four keys of engagement are this, uh, and you can find out more on our website, but they're the hard, hard fun of challenge and master, I'm sorry, the easy fun of, challenge, of uh, exploration and role play. So the mechanics here are all about fantasy, creativity, exploration. It's easy fun. The second one is hard fun, which is more about having a goal, a particular obstacle, strategy to overcome. Different type of fun. It's different to try, and it's why a basketball hoop is really small and overhead, right? If it was really down here and big, you wouldn't, it wouldn't feel fun to go in. And then people fun is all about communication and cooperation, uh, you know, competition. It's more fun, fun to play with, with friends. And then lastly, we've got serious fun with collection, rhythm, and completion mechanics. And that actually changes the brain state to a different, a different, um, a different form of, of engagement. So you, you, when you get into uh, Pac-Man, for example, the rhythm of eating the dots, uh, the rhythm of tapping, uh, the tapping a button can actually engage a player. All these are engaging experiences, all very different, and it turns out that they all relate to uh, driving what, uh, what we see in these best-performing uh, best free-to-play games. There's a model you can download on our website or 4, 4k2f.com. And uh, let's, let's get started with the, um, uh, with the deep dive. So on the surface level, why do players spend money? Well, they can spend money in general. They often spend it for appearance upgrades, functional upgrades, change, some, changes the functionality of a, um, of a game. They also might play for progress. So, hey, I'm going to finish this in five minutes instead of five hours. Or, you know, I've got you know, a horde of things you know, coming to me in my battle game, and let's, let's finish it you know, now. Let's build it now so that I can, I, can, um, I can solve this problem. Or unlock. Unlock a new net level, mission packs, you know, new, new feature. Uh, now, we could leave it there. But what I'm going to try and just communicate to you, the important thing is we want to dive deeper. We want to invent new mechanics or flavors of these that will drive and increase your monetization and your, um, your results uh, in, in your free-to-play games. So let's take a look deeper at uh, the, psychology, the psychology of fun, uh, how games, the emotions from gameplay drive spending in, in games. And if we can understand why game spending is fun, then we can actually then, you can go out here after this talk and uh, design new mechanics. So what we found is that players spend to do really four things. The emotions are, are spending for four things. They're really playing to explore. We found a lot of evidence they're playing to, to explore. Um, they're also, um, the emotions are leading them to compete, to win, to, you know, um, to compete with each other, uh, to socialize, a lot of social behaviors, a lot of social emotions, and to collect. Those are like the four really driving mechanics that we're finding uh, behind many of these successful monetization strategies. And so these map to the four keys here in terms of uh, exploration of easy fun in the upper right, competition in the um, upper left, uh, socializing in the um, uh, lower left, and then collecting the lower right. And then if we can get these emotions, these emotions, in a sense, are triggering behaviors. They're triggering the purchases that we're seeing uh, in games. So let's look at curiosity first, which is our first emotion. And curiosity encourages exploration of the store. So we can customize our character. We can tell a story with a description, mystery packs, you know, a package that you can buy that you don't know what the contents are, uh, being creative. All of these have very, you know, nothing related to challenge, really. These have different, but they are experiences. They are different, you know, uh, different sequences that get you curious. You want to find out what happens. A great example is uh, the Stash and Jetpack Joyride. So here you can not only customize your character in some cool ways, you know, with, with watermelon hats and robo bodies and stuff like that, but there's also this really cool, this, this fun description. So here, a sensei's threads, you know, had fruit stains on it, took it forever to get out. And that's a nod to their other game, you know, Fruit Ninja. And so you've got this whole behavior of like, once you've clicked a couple times, you kind of want to continue clicking. And now it's really brilliant of them not to have all the descriptions open, but that you have to click. Because then you're clicking and reading, clicking and reading, clicking and reading, clicking and reading, and then you just might hit that buy button, right? 
So you've established a, a play pattern, you've rewarded that, that interaction pattern, and then you might, you're just one step closer to actually hitting, hitting the buy. And it's also just an engaging activity you might, might uh, otherwise not, not have. So it's fun to tap to explore. The second emotion that we're going to uh, share with you today is uh, all about fiero. Um, it's the opportunity to compete and to win. Uh, we don't really have a good word in English, um, so I introduced the term fiero from Italian, uh, and that's that feeling of the body's on fire. It's yes. It's when the arms punch the sky. And you can't feel like you win unless you're like, about ready to throw your iPhone through the window. And at that point you win, that's when you feel really like, all right, you know, I, I got it. I'm, I'm the boss. Now, how does this work into this free-to-play space? It's rather interesting um, that you, it changes, purchases change gameplay. They offer a new strategy. They're fair. They're not fair. They're unfair. And uh, they fill, fulfill a specific player need. Uh, Candy Crush has got some brilliant mechanics here in that uh, you actually earn the right to buy something in the store. Well, so first of all, what they're buying, you're buying, uh, you're buying an extra move, you're buying, or you're getting an extra move from a friend. You are, um, you know, getting, you know, you're able to, you're, it's about along the path, so maybe you can win this level. But they, did, they didn't just give you a bunch of things, hey, buy this, buy that, buy that. You had to earn each one. And so, in a sense, what, from the player's point of view, they're already halfway committed to this thing. They're curious about it, to reference the first emotion, and then if they, if they get it, they may get some of the second emotion, which is fiero, which is a very, very you know, powerful uh, game, game emotion. So I thought that was a really brilliant design in that they're edging players into the play experiences uh, by stuff that they're earning in the game. So it's earning the right to, right to, right to play. Uh, being fair and unfair uh, is awesome in Jetpack Joyride because of the counterfeit machine. How many people have bought the counterfeit machine in Jetpack? Yeah? Okay. Just a couple? All right. <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's awesome because it basically doubles. It's a coin doubler. So the coins you earn are automatically doubled. So you buy this and then your score is going to be twice as much as your friends or, in the, in, or you have twice the buying power, which then could you know, accelerate you up that curve faster. Um, and then I don't know if you notice the, the price tag on that is $4.99. So, for a free-to-play game, you spend five bucks, you get this, you know, this, this privilege. And if all of your friends have bought it, then you might, you know, have done that as well. Um, but I thought that was, um, that's a really um, great, great example of using that, the desire to win, the desire for Fiero to, you know, make this, make this purchase, because it makes it easier. Now, it's not just, you know, making it easier to win or making your score higher, it's also strategy. So some of the upgrades, the gadgets change the gameplay, so it changes how you have to play that level. And so these are great, um, uh, great, uh, you know, add additions to the games, whether it's your air berries or your, uh, your insta ball. Those are changing how the game actually plays. And I don't know if you can notice at the bottom of the screen, though, is that they're doing, now we're starting to see some game design in the store, in that you have to buy something on the top in order to unlock new stuff at the bottom. So now there's a purchasing game. If I per make purchases at the top, then I'm going to unlock stuff at the bottom. And in fact, of course, there's the missions, um, the missions to actually buy something in the store. Uh, with your, um, uh, with your hard-earned cash. We're going to come back to Jetpack in a little bit, um, but let's, let's go on to Tiny Towers, because I think this is another in-store game, which is really brilliant. Uh, shopping for currency in Tiny Towers is also a game. Uh, you can see that the, the conversion ratio of tower bucks, which are the rare currency, to coins, which are the common, if you only turn in one, you get 250. If you turn in 50, you get 100,000. And so if you were, if you manage, if you have self-control to not spend and, you know, hoard up your, your tower bucks, you can actually get quite a lot more progress in the game if you do that. And then as a player, once you read that list and figure it out, that strategy, you feel smart. You feel like you've gamed the system. And that, of course, like and all the game designers in the room, that's what we do is we, we really try and make the player feel smart. We make them feel frustrated, of course, but we make them feel smart for figuring something out. So having these little games inside the store really help, um, uh, really help out. Because now I'm also, again, I'm touching the money, I'm evaluating the money, I'm using the money, I'm moving it around, so maybe I will actually you know, do, do a spend. So second to the last emotion is amusement. And uh, this, we've been dancing around this issue uh, all talk here, and I thought I'd call it out here, is that there's a psychological principle that money erodes trust. So if you and I were friends and I could, as an example, and I would say, hey, I've got a flight tomorrow morning, can you drive me to the airport? And if we're friends, you might say, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll drive to the airport, maybe. Uh, but I can't say like, hey, I've got a flight tomorrow morning, you know, and can you drive me to the airport? Here's 100 bucks. Right? How does that feel? It's like either you're doing it because we're friends or we're doing it because I'm a taxi service. And now as a game coming by, you know, game comes in and says, hey, look, I can get, you can get all these things for, you know, 100 in-game dollars. It's not, it's, um, 
it's not quite as friendly. It's not quite as you know, uh, social. It's not quite as, there's a little bit of, of friction that, that creates it, especially when you've got anything attached to a social network. Because that's eroding, if you're eroding trust, you're actually eroding the bonds, the social bonds that uh, the whole network is designed, to, is designed around. So you're actually you know, decreasing your social currency between friends. So what we can do is we can use amusement. It's a great way to build trust. Uh, there are a number of different techniques, but amusement, creating amusement, actually, if your friend makes you laugh, roll on the floor, when you can breathe again, you kind of feel closer to that person. Okay? So the purpose of, one of the purposes of emotions, of the emotion amusement, is to actually you know, create social bonds. So let's do that with our game. So we have, obviously, sharing with friends, and we can use amusement to balance you know, frustration, but we can also use it to do mix and match. So you can offer things in the store that allow you to mix and match um, in kind of some fun ways. And a not serious attitude really goes far uh, with, with regard to this emotion. It's like, hey, you know, why not give it a try? Why not you know, put on the Santa hat you know, in your jetpack joyride? Why not you know, dress all of your, um, your workers uh, in the music store as little bees? Right? Yeah, we got, I bought the bee suit for all my little workers in the record store. Uh, and then I can show that to my friends. It kind of it makes me laugh, makes them laugh, and then I, m I feel much more friendly towards that uh, thing. Now I think we're just getting started as an industry with really, really doubling down on amusement. I think that you know if you could focus on one of the things, um, amusement is probably the best, uh, the best one because anything it's in, amusement is part of people fun, and there are more emotions in people fun than the others combined. And of course, with free to play, actually paying real money is eroding trust. So you've got both of those reasons to really look at how your game might create amusement. So for example, in Tiny Towers, this is an opposite example, is that it's really great that I can compare the sizes of my towers. You know, I'm, I'm 53 floors or whatever, and my nearest friend's 42. Um, and so that's really cool. It, it drives the need for social spending in the game. Social comparison drives the need for spending. But then if you made this really amusing, then you've got something that you could go back and forth with between your friends, and then you're laughing, and then they're laughing, you do something, they do something. You can create this really cool emotional engagement loop uh, that creates amusement, and then they're going to feel, not only are they going to be spending more, but then they're also going to feel closer and tighter, and you're, you know, you're actually providing a service for all that spending, which is uh, increasing the strength of social bonds. You know, you're, you're weaving that fabric tighter. And who could argue with that? Right? I, think that's, I think that's awesome. I think that's, why, that's actually why a lot of why I'm in games is to uh, unlock human potential through play and bring people together. So making it fun to share, uh, I love this mechanic in Farmville, uh, is that when my, when, my, when my farm, and that is my farm, well long ago, uh, was all withered, it creates embarrassment, right? For, for someone can come, one of my friends can come, and then they sell the unwither spray so that I feel less embarrassed. So there are some very fun you know, social mechanics that you can do. And then an unwithered spray, kind of amusing. Um, you know, that's, there's, some, there's some fun. But again, I think the current social games are really just one dimension depend, uh, based on the research we've done. There's tons and tons of social mechanics that we're just not even touching yet. Um, so you can you know, download some of my white papers or videos and, and hear a little bit more about um, people fun. But again, I think that's a, that's a really brilliant thing. So last one is, last key is desire. And uh, it's really all about creating the uh, perception of value. So this is uh, serious fun. And so basically after the gameplay is complete, you want to have there be a reason. If you get a reason why or something you know, from the game that's, that, that you value, then that, that game feels less like a waste of time. So it's a really nice way to finish out uh, a loop. And these, you want to increase the perception of value also just because, hey, if I'm buying something, I'm giving you money, I should get something of value back. So you know, that's, that's a really nice mapping as well. So meaning and value, um, one of the most easy ones to do is to increase the tactile impression of worth. I, I've just got some gold coins up here just to make the point. But if you think about Bejeweled and, um, and Candy Crush, you, know, it just, you just want to lick the screen. You, want, you really want to hold their fingers itch to touch them. You really want to put them in your mouth. All of those things you know, increase the tactile sensation. And you can also, in a non-food way, really like, it, these look like doubloons, you know, these gold doubloons. I want to collect as many as I can. So having those buttons, those icons of what you have, have them be puffy, have them be like, oh, I want to, you know, collect them, have little slots for them to slip into, you know, all of those things will help uh, drive your conversion. In terms of innovation, uh, Jetpack here, I think, does just one of the most amazing entries into a store that, uh, that I've seen in Free to Play is that the, uh, at the, they make death trivial, meaningless, really. Uh, and when you die, you can have, the, you've, you've collected perhaps these, these final spins. 
And uh, you can, you, so it's cost you nothing to get there other than dying. And then when you spin, you get what? You get free currency that you can use in the store. You get free items that you could, would otherwise purchase. And so like I actually got that little speed boost um, in this spin. I didn't quite get the right frame as the screen capture. But then, hey, wow, I just discovered something. It's free. I'm going to go use it on my next playthrough. Oh, I just got some free money. And that free money isn't really part of their, because they, they didn't earn the money. You know, they didn't collect those coins. They just kind of won them. They didn't even like, have to put in money to win them, right? They just kind of won them. So it's not like their money yet. And so at that point, you know, they can just pop over into the stash, pop over in the store, and spend the money that they, it isn't really theirs yet, right? It's, it's not, and that's trivial. So all of those things allows you to sample stuff in the store, giving you free money, free ways to just kind of sample. And then once you've gotten that purchase beha behavior established, then you can move it, move it forward uh, into uh, some more you know, monetizable. Um, purchases. So to summarize, uh, just making a little four, four little points here, and then we'll have some time for questions. So I hope you guys have some thinking, put your thinking caps on. Uh, the first one is we want to really make the store fun. So these are the, the messages. You want to make the store fun, whether it's, you know, a strategy game, uh, the hard fun strategy game of trying to get more currency or more items or the best deals. Um, and then, uh, and, and then the, um, or, you know, telling that story, be, having them be fun to explore. Have there be some bigger world that's happening that it's really part of this, you know, part of this gameplay experience. And that you could just spend, you know, quite a long time just, you know, clicking and, and reading that, that content. The second one would be to play to, to play to progress, which I didn't mention earlier, is just as important as being able to pay. So here I can end the game or play on. The play on is, of course, requires the purchase. But it gives me the impression that I could, you know, just restart the level and, you know, and actually play. And, if I play this level enough, you know, I will, I will move on. If you don't allow people to progress, this is one of the big mistakes clients uh, make when they come to us. If you don't allow players to progress through play, when they pay, uh, it's less valuable. You know, so if it, takes me 10, if it takes me 10 minutes to do you know, task X, and then I'm going to pay 99 cents to uh, alleviate or remove that task X, um, then that's 10 minutes. You know, so then there's a conversion, right? But if there's no way to actually earn it through play, uh, then, you know, then, then when I'm paying for it, it doesn't, um, it doesn't have as much value, if that makes sense. Uh, so you want to, and then, of course, earning the right to, uh, earn the right for these badges, um, uh, whether it's paying or playing, you know, earn the right to move forward. The third is customization. And uh, this is people fun, creating amusement. Um, the avatar in the world, you know, role play, these are some popular ways. There's, there's many more that you can use to uh, create amusement, but customizing is a pretty, you know, pretty, pretty popular one. And then uh, lastly, you know, show the player that you care. And so these are the attitudes that we want to come out of the, um, out of the experience. So in Jetpack Joyride, we are being generous as the game, right? We are you know, not charging my friend 100 bucks to drive me to the airport. We are like, hey, here's some free money. Here's some, here's some free stuff. Come and, you know, it's not just first sample is free either. You can, have, you can collect three or four or five or 10 free, free spins on a level if you want to, if you're, if you're a good enough player. And so that's just generating this like, oh, wow, you know, I'm getting, getting free stuff. And the key thing here, too, another key thing is that I actually had to, I actually have to, like, you know, move the lever. So I feel like I have some agency. And as anyone who's worked in Vegas on slot machines, you know, it's that, you know, that pull or that push that allows you to, you know, make your, make your choice. And so, like, it's, you know, it's, it's a, one action to start and then an action to stop. If, you, if they have to stop those reels, regardless of whether they're really stopping the reels, um, if they feel like they're stopping the reels, then, um, then, they're, then they feel like they had some role, more of a role in that. They felt that they, like they had a role, they were, that they were lucky, but they had agency in that, and they'll feel better about that experience. You can also do near misses, you know, like almost, and then ramp that. Uh, not legal to do in Vegas, legal so far to do in games, as far as long as it's not for real currency. Uh, and that makes it more exciting. It's like, oh, I almost got the three cherries. So in other words, what we want to do is we want to make purchasing part of the play. So we want to take the emotions, ability to focus, remember, decide, perform, and learn. We want to take those characteristics of emotions and then map them to the actions and situations and, and behaviors that we, are, we have in our monetization, our monetization events. So allowing ourselves to explore, setting players up to explore with our, with our purchases, um, uh, be able to compete, socialize, and, and collect. So that's, um, and then that's, yeah, so that's it. It's all related to the four keys to fun. You can find out more on our website uh, if you like.
And um, I've got a few times for to, a few minutes for questions. Here's my contact information. Please feel free to um, give me a shout out. And that's Tilt World, which is our little game that's planting trees in Madagascar. All right. Thank you, Nicole. Yeah. Let's give her a hand. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. A lot of a lot of great information in a 20-minute <laughs> rapid-fire fashion no, there. I, I didn't see anybody's ears fall off. That that, no, that happened was, last time, and yeah, that was not pretty. It was it was wonderful. Good right. stuff. Any questions for Nicole? You've been describing um, very general theory and very good examples. Yeah. Do you have cases where you said, try that, right. and it failed horribly? And you learned something great, but it was a surprise for you that your, the, 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 your emotion classification didn't really work right. so well with the users. Right. Yeah, we've had a number of cases where we, um, the opposite, which is where we generally improve retention and monetization by 30 to 60 percent. Um, I think one of the things that will be the most interesting is uh, the progress one. We're still doing research on it, so I can't say, I can't say. But there's some early indication of like, you know, how long is that timer, for example? Like, is it, you know, in, when you're in a sequence, when you're in a, um, uh, a thing and you want to like, you know, press a button to, to, to pay it off, you know, are people more satisfied or more frustrated by the long timers or by the short timers? How does short timer, if that makes sense, the, sh the shorter timers, um, does that actually decrease motivation and is there like a little bit of a sweet spot? So um, that's, that's the question that we're working on, but no results yet. But check back in a couple months. We'll, we'll, we'll have it for you. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Nicole. Yeah. Um, can you give us some other examples of things where games are maybe pushing the limits of what would be illegal in Vegas? <laughs> um, wh Money. Wh what's going too far? Because I don't right. actually know the rules of Vegas. Right, right. And I don't, I'm not an expert. I'm not a lawyer. Disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer. Um, but I think that the, uh, the most obvious one is the, the near misses, because that gives you that little emotional boost, and that's exactly what you want to do as a game, as a game designer. Um, and uh, the other one is simply um, you know, the conversion of you know, real money to, I mean, play money to real money is, uh, is, is, pretty, is pretty obvious. And I think there's some other rules that I can't, um, or just some, some patterns in terms of, the, uh, of what you can actually um, uh, what you can actually say, but there's a really interesting mapping of like, I think it's more game design now is, is actually influencing Vegas than the other way around, if that makes sense. Because now you're seeing these video pokers and video things that'll have the easy fun, the exploration role play, like you, you get a spin and suddenly you've got this speed round where you're just, there's no skill at all, you're just tapping to win more prizes. Um, so, but yeah, if you come up to me after all, I might be able to think of another one. But yeah, it's a good question. Anything else? Another one back there somewhere? So you mentioned just now about the uh, concept of fun, right, amusement, right? And I think we've, I've had a kind of a debate with uh, one of our uh, other game designers before about um, making something, a purchase item uh, only for aesthetic looks. Sure. And that will you know, fall into the category of being fun. Yeah. How, how effective do you think that is compared to an item that you buy and gives you functional utility? Right. Um, right, right. So how, how do those? Yeah, yeah. So you have appearance upgrades on one hand, and you have functional upgrades on another hand. And it's really the answer is going to uh, rely on the player. Uh, the first, just remembering now, there's more than one type of fun. You know, so that's what the four fun keys is about. There's like, you know, I can have fun this way, I can have fun that way, I have fun that way. Appearance upgrades are doing one type, and then functional upgrades are another. Uh, I think that there is, uh, we've had the best data on consumable versus non-consumable. And then, you know, consumables definitely drive more monetization than non-consumables, just because you have, if you think about it, because you have to use them over and over and over and over again. So in a Jetpack, when you've got that, the, the little pack of speed boosts, and then you run out, then you would have, a, a, you know, another set to go. Um, the thing to look for that I didn't mention, which I think is a really good point, is the uh, ability of this purchase or related activity, an, an activity related to a purchase, to drive virtually unlimited play. And so that's where appearance is going to trump functionally, um, in a sense, because then you can just, if you have a game mechanic that is all about appearances, you can just decorate your avatar till cows come home. And then functional upgrades um, are different. But where the, um, if people are competing, if people are doing any of those other keys, you know, the functional upgrades just feel more, more useful. And they, and they change the game. They feel, and so if you get bored of the game, a functional upgrade is going to f change the game more than appearance upgrade will. 
around, 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 around. These are great questions, folks. Uh, great presentation. Thank Do you, you see differences by age group on how these play patterns or the you know uh, fun emotions play into the actual uh, free-to-play model? Yeah, yeah. So. Um, uh, so for the four keys itself, we did um, everything from Tetris to Halo, Call of Duty to Bejeweled, and then Young and Old, both genders, all platforms that were in existence at the time. So that was pretty much um, uh, cross. And you know, I think that the bottom was you know around the 13-year-olds. We went we went as low as five. We've done some work with um, on, on the lower end. Now with purchasing, that's a different egg because if you're under 13, then it's your mother or your dad's credit card that's being involved. And so that kind of purchase is much, um, much harder. But one of the more brilliant strategies on that low end was uh, Club Penguin's uh, strategy from years ago, which is you could earn as much in-game currency as you wanted to free, as a free, -to -play, free player, but then you couldn't actually buy anything for your igloo, like the disco ball or the cute outfit, unless you were a subscriber. And so then you could see all of your friends having really cool stuff. And so that would pressure parents to you know, um, you know, do more of a, of a subscription model. Uh, you'll have, um, you have a lot of angry parents um, with microtransactions, and you'll see in the App Store, both for, you know, you know, for Candy Crush Saga and a number of these other free-to-play games, the second paragraph is, this game has in-app purchases. If you don't want to purchase apps, you know, turn it off in your settings. Because uh, it does, uh, you know, you know, kids will rack up $5,000 worth of purchases inside some of these games, and their parents are not too thrilled with, with, that, with that, that outcome. Um, there's also some interesting ones where you know, they, they actually have um, allowances you know, based on in-game currency, which is kind of fun, just a behavior pattern within a family. I think it's cool. Yeah. You want one more question? Or? Oh, two more? So you mentioned that um, amusement was one of the ones that was stronger yeah. in, in some ways than yeah. some of the others. And you, you also mentioned that in your testing, you'd also worked in, in some of the like perhaps some more hardcore games like Halo or whatnot. Yeah, we've yeah we've done uh, stuff with a lot of stuff with Lucas and um, first-person shooters, you know, EA and all that that sort of range. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm just curious because yeah. I mean I love Jetpack Joyride as much as anyone else, but like a lot of the examples seem to be from genres that were more th that would allow for more like amusement to be built in and not be like genre breaking. Mm -hmm. um, do you have examples of how to incorporate or More ideas of, like... Well, I would, I would give you one word, or I guess it's three, wow, World of Warcraft. Um, so the art style in World of Warcraft, it's a, hard, it's a hardcore game. But the art style is very, it's, it's scary but cute, right? There's a roundness to all of the buttons. The characters, you know, why do the characters do dances? Those silly dances, right? And so it's, um, there's, there's the hard fun of battle, and then that may not be amusing at all, at all. But then you've got this other type of you know, interaction that's, that's creating amusement. And so when we talk about player experiences, I look at a player experience profile, kind of like if we're tasting wine or chocolate. There's a nose, there's a head, and a nice long finish. And that you want to experience moment to moment in the game different sets of emotions because that, you know, those experiences go through the body. And um, not only are they driving you know, different behaviors and stuff like that, but that's, that's why we're playing. That's why you go to a movie. But you play a game because now your decisions are actually even more involved with those, with those experiences. So um, yeah, I think that the examples I gave, I didn't want to, um, I wanted to kind of stick to a couple of, of games just for consistency's sake, but they actually also work um, in, um, in, in hardcore games. I mean, why do you trash talk, you know, in a, in a hardcore game? I mean, they're, you know, why do you say, oh, you're stupid, or I own you, or like, you know, and then I, exclamation point, you know, really bad, I, I just say something terrible about you, and then you laugh, right? There's, you know, that's a different type of amusement in a sense, right? But it's, a, it's, it's, totally, it's totally within that realm, and that's, that's, how, you, that's how you bond. A lot of people want. One more. All the way in the back of the room. All right. You guys have been a great audience. Um, so I think you've probably already answered this a bit, but um, uh -huh. with the four key types of fun, I, obviously some games will have more of a particular sort of fun than others. But do you think that for a game to be successful, it needs to have elements of all of the types of fun, or? Are there games out there that only, you know, only have hard fun and right. don't have anything else? Yeah, so we just cycle the clock back to 2004. The PS2 hadn't launched, the Xbox 360 had not launched. That was the game industry. And pretty much most of the games were hard fun. That's what we thought you know, game design was. And what we did by watching people actually play, they were doing these crazy things. And the best-selling games, turns out that they were actually doing three, at least three out of the four. And so they were, you know, people were taking their sims and putting them in the pool to pull out the ladders to see what happens. They were driving their Grand Theft Auto car through a plate glass window. 
not related to challenge at all, right? So there's two types of fun. And then they go back to the challenge. You know, they, go, they, go, you know, they go back and forth. Um, so I, I say generally is that you want to aim for at least three out of the four. Um, the one that you, at that point in time, and now is becoming much less so, was people fun. Because most games were at that time, you know, single player. Uh, these days, you know, having social is really important, especially for free to play. You know, you're, you're dead in the water if you don't have, have, well, almost dead in the water if you don't have some sort of people fun. Uh, so I like to say, you know, three out of the four. A good example of something that just does one thing really well is Bejeweled. Now, the old original Bejeweled, the old Bejeweled was, you know, just serious fun in spades. It was collection, completion, rhythm, bright, shiny stuff, very visceral, got you into a zen focus, not particularly challenging. And so it seemed to be doing that, but then Bejeweled Blitz comes along, right, which then, you know, adds people fun. And then the time mode, when we actually watch people play, they found it very challenging. So, so things kind of folded out um, that way. But there are more, uh, there's uh, the original white paper on why, why people play games is on our website at zeodesign.com and you can download this poster for free as well and as well as, you know, come and, come and ping me and I'm, I'm happy to answer questions and, you know, help you on your, on your games. All right, thank you, Nicole. Yeah.